started getting started a little bit late. And just as Pam said, we do have some people joining us via Zoom. So we've got some people online that can hear and interact. And also we're videotaping this. And we'll send out the link to the videotape um, as soon as we get that back. So you guys can share that with your colleagues as well. So welcome. Thank you for coming today. Um, again, I'm Beth Daniels. I'm one of your Heinemann Stenfoss Food Source Reps in Iowa. And this is one of my partners, Kelly Westmoreland. We're thrilled that you're here today. Um, cut to the chase. So we're really honored to have Dr. Pam Smith with us here. Um, Pam is a national content specialist with Heinemann. So I like to say she's the knower of all things Heinemann. FMP, <laughs> Lucy Calkins, she knows it all. So, um, and Pam brings a great deal of background knowledge to the table. Pam's been a classroom teacher for many, many years, a principal in the curriculum and administration roles as well. Um, and so she looks at our products from multiple eyes that you all can relate to. So without further ado, I'll let you take it over. Thank you. No, you did great. You actually probably said too much, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll forgive you for that. But okay. um, good morning, everybody. Glad to be here, and good morning to our friends joining us via Zoom. I'm hoping they're hearing this. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started so that I can uh, really give you time with the folks that you came to hear. Um, but our friends from Solon are here, and they've, uh, you know, have already adopted, if you will. Am I okay to say adopted FPC? Um, and so they're just getting started with their rollout and their implementation. So you guys will get to ask them questions, kind of pick their brains, and find out how things are going for them. But before we do that, let me share with you about FPC. Um, FPC, how many of you are current users of benchmark assessment? What about LLI, Level Literacy Intervention? Okay. So for those of us who are familiar with LLI, for so long we have said, man, I wish they had this for the regular, like for everybody, right? I wish we had this for the regular classroom for everybody. And so that really, in a nutshell, is what FPC is. It's that same research-based high-quality instruction for our core reading in our, in all, for all of our classrooms. And so what we have with FPC really is a way of teaching reading across the school day. So typically the way our schools are structured across the nation is our teachers are given like a block of time to deliver reading instruction, right? With FPC, it's designed to make use of that block of time, but also provide additional instruction outside of that block of time. And as we go through, I'll, I'll walk you through what that really looks like across a day, okay? So the first thing I want to have you do, since everybody has a sampler, and the sampler is that big thick book that you picked up over here, Right? It feels like a book. Um, notice that each one is a different color. So if you're used to LLI, the colors align with LLI. So orange is kindergarten, green is first grade, blue is second grade. So if you'll just pick one of those, it doesn't matter which grade level. And if you'll turn to page 10 in that sampler, on page 10 of the sampler, it shows you time frames for each of the components of FPC. Now, this chart is in no way in there to show you the order in which the instruction should be delivered. That's not the purpose of the chart. The purpose is to show you time frames around each of these practices. So how much time does it, you know, do we need to devote to an interactive read aloud? How much time do we devote to shared reading and so forth? So it's strictly in there for time frames. So if you'll look for each one of the components, there's a time measure associated with that. But if you look at the bottom right of that table, it's going to show you total number of hours. It's going, to, it's going to range from two and a half to three hours, depending on the grade level that you're looking at. So what that means is that's the amount of time we should devote to reading instruction across the school day. Okay. So as I said, as I go through and I present each of these components, they may seem big, but that's just because I'm trying to make sure that I'm like very, being thorough about each one. But just know when I talk about interactive read aloud, I'm talking about 15 minutes of your day, okay? So that's really to help us keep it in perspective. The other thing I wanna point out on that page are the, all the little colored tiles. So you see seven different colored tiles inside of that chart. Each of those tiles represent, each one represents a component of FPC. So if you see a colored tile, just know that there's materials, there's a component within FPC for that practice. 
Again, I'll go through each one of those, explaining and describing um, each one as uh, thoroughly as time allows us this morning. And so I want you to know that with each of these components, we're going to talk about them as practices, but then I'm going to talk also about the materials within FPC. But if we don't understand the practice first, materials don't, they don't mean anything, right? Because materials don't teach kids, teachers teach kids, right? So before I do that, though, I want to introduce, for those of you who've never seen Fountas and Pinnell, I want to introduce them via the screen here, not that they're coming to speak to you, right? Um, but, you know, I still go places and folks don't realize they're actual people. They think it's Fountas and Pinnell is a thing. Um, and what's really amusing to them and almost kind of creepy to them is that FMP is now a verb, <laughs> right? Have you FMP'd your kids? Right? So that kind of freaks them out a little bit, but we have good laughs about it. Um, but yes, please meet Fountas and Pinnell. And, you know, these two ladies have totally transformed literacy instruction over the last 20 plus, you know, really 30 years, 30 plus years. It started with their first publication back in 1996, that guided reading book, the white cover with the red letters, right? The ones that look really ragged now sitting on our shelves. That was their very first publication. It didn't mean that their, their professional lives began on that day, right? Um, and as a matter of fact, ever since then, they have been going gangbusters and really continuing to transform all that we know about teaching literacy. So they now have a new edition of guided reading that just came out last year, year before last, within the last couple of years. And they have learned, as you might imagine, they have learned a good bit in the last 20 plus years, right? They've learned a lot since 1996. So some of the new edition of guided reading is a total rewrite. Um, some of it they didn't touch. And um, a lot of it they did revise. It is a good bit thicker, you'll notice, than the, the original edition. And it is, again, it's, it's indicative of all they've learned through their practices as college professors in uh, education departments at their uh, universities where they're associated. But this resource is foundational. This is one of the foundational pieces to FPC. Um, I heard Irene Fountas say not long ago that FPC really has been about a decade in the making. So all of the parts that I'm gonna show you, this has kind of been brewing around in their brains for about 10 years. And so what they've done is all of the practices that make up FPC, there's narrative in this guided reading book around the practices. Okay, so this book is about way more than guided reading. One of the changes they made is actually a change to the subtitle. It's now called Guided Reading Responsive Teaching Across the Grades. And I'll share with you in just a few minutes what they mean by responsive teaching, because that is one of the underpinning principles of, to FPC. So if we can understand the cycle and the process of being a responsive teacher, FPC makes more sense to us, okay? But the guided reading is really a foundational piece to understanding the practices that the materials support, okay? The other foundational piece, and for those of you using benchmark assessment, this is no stranger, hopefully, but the other, really, this is right at the, the heart and the center of all things Fountas and Pinnell is their literacy continuum. If you have benchmark assessment, if you have a first or second edition of benchmark assessment, your continuum also looks a little different, right? So this is the new expanded edition of the continuum that is now part of BAS third edition, but it's also the curriculum for FPC. So in order to know and understand FPC, you have to interact with the continuum because this is the curriculum. This is where every part of FPC was born from and you'll hear me reference the continuum throughout our time together. So this is also foundational to the system. Okay, so let's jump in and let's talk about a little more in depth the role of the continuum. So what we have is we have the continuum which identifies for us the reading behaviors that we need to notice teach for and support across the day. That's really what the continuum identifies for us, are all of those reading behaviors that we need to know about, we need to be observing and finding evidence of. 
throughout the course of our day. It actually starts with our assessment system. So the language that makes up the benchmark assessment, whether it is your comprehension conversation prompts, whether it is what we're asking kids to do in the writing about reading, the continuum, again, is the resource where that was born. Now with FPC, as I've already shared, the continuum is the curriculum for FPC. And then, those of you using LLI, we now have the complete and total system for teaching reading for kids above, on, or below where they need to be, okay? And the continuum, you'll notice, lies right at the center of this because, again, this is the curriculum for all things Fountas and Pinnell. So in a nutshell, the continuum does two things for teachers. And by the way, if you are using benchmark assessment in your schools and your teachers are not making use of the continuum of daily practice, start there first. Don't jump into FPC until you are using the continuum to inform your day-to-day -day instructional decisions. That's your first step, okay? Because here's what happens. When you administer benchmark assessment, that data is going to tell you every student's independent and instructional reading levels. From that information, teachers then need to decide placement level. Where am I going to place kids for small group instruction? Right? Because typically independent level is one or two levels below instructional level. Right? So you have to make a decision. Am I placing them based on independent level or am I placing them based on instructional level? Fountas and Pinnell will tell you to place them based on instructional level. Okay? So, once you have that information, then you can form your small groups. Then the continuum comes in and says, hey, the data you have tells you what your readers know and are able to do as readers. What the continuum does then is it tells you what your readers need to know and do next as readers. So if teachers are not using that as an everyday planning tool, then that's where I always recommend folks to start. Okay? So, it's going to do two things for teachers. First, it's going to help them define books. It's going to help them pick the right books for their kids. It's going to help them pick the right books for whole group activities, such as a shared reading or a read aloud. It's very important that we, don't, that we not waste those opportunities, but yet we have very explicit purposes and reasons for doing those practices. So if I know who my readers are, what they bring to the table, then I can plan everything around what they need to know next as readers, okay? The second thing that it does for us is it helps us define those reading behaviors. What is it our kids need to know and do next? Okay. So within the continuum, you'll notice the new expanded edition has new color coding, okay? It makes the use of this much more efficient because if I know the, the system of color coding, I can go right to the section that I need. So for each of those little tiles on page 10, there's a corresponding section. So guided reading is a little blue tile. And that's because in the continuum, it's the blue section. Okay? So the color coding matches the components of FPC because this resource, again, should be part of our daily instructional practice, our planning, our conversations, our collaboration, everything. So let me illustrate for you. The thickest section in this book is the guided reading section. The reason for that is not because it's most important. It's because it's organized by text level, okay, A to Z. So for every text level on the Fountas and Pinnell text level gradient, there's a corresponding section in this guided reading part. The rest of the continuum all of the other practices represented are organized by grade level, okay? So the interactive read aloud section is organized pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, all the way through eighth grade. The guided reading section is the only one organized by text level, okay? That's why it's thickest. So let me show you in practice what this really feels like, okay? I've already administered benchmark assessment. I know what my readers know and are able to do, okay? I know this. I've already put them in groups. I've formed my groups for that small group instruction. So let's say one of my groups is a level B group. So in order for me to 
be effective in working with that group of students. I need to know who they are in terms of behaviors, not in terms of a, of a, of a letter B, because the B tells us nothing unless we understand the behaviors that that B represents, okay? So when I open this section up to my level B, I'm gonna notice a couple things. The intro paragraph, I call it the profile paragraph. If you read that paragraph and if you help and coach teachers and get them accustomed to going straight to that profile paragraph, it talks about kids reading at a text level B in terms of behaviors, what they can do, okay? The other thing that that profile paragraph allows us to do is have much more effective parent conferences. So instead of me telling parents that your kid's reading at a level B, which means nothing to parents, and really it gets them really anxious if they know that they need to be at a Z at some point, because B is a long way from Z, right? So keep the letters out of it, you know what I'm saying? And if we can talk in terms of what they can do and what they know as readers when we're talking to parents, it makes us sound really smart, right? But it really empowers those parents because it's easy to say, hey, when they're reading at home, notice them doing this or listen for them to do that. Ask them about this, right? Now, this profile paragraph paints a picture of this reader for both fiction and nonfiction because we understand it requires a varied skill set when we go from fiction reading to nonfiction reading. Right? As a matter of fact, if you think about the benchmark assessment system, when you're using a nonfiction text to administer that assessment, if kids don't read the headings, it counts as errors. Well, part of the instruction is teaching kids that that's an integral part of reading a nonfiction text. So you can bet that, at certain te that when you get to a certain text level in this guided reading part and it talks about nonfiction readers, that's going to be a part of it. Right? So, the profile paragraph, I can't say enough about it. It's, it's little, it's short, but man, it really, really teaches us a whole lot about the kids we're, we're sitting in front of. What it does is it really allows teachers to see those kids as a, very differently than if they don't know this information, okay? The other part on this page are the 10 text characteristics that every text is measured by to determine text level. So the Fountas and Pinnell leveling system relies on 10 text characteristics, okay? It is the most comprehensive of all leveling systems out there. Words is part of it. Sentence structure is part of it. Genre is part of it, right? I could go on and on, but there are 10 text characteristics. This section helps us know and understand what makes a B book a B book, right? That's critically important, because if, if teachers have books on their shelves or in your, in your media center, and guys, by the way, not every book should have a level on it. Fountas and Pinnell are the first ones to say, don't go level all of your books. That's not real world, that's not authentic. Kids, they, they don't go to Barnes and Noble or a bookstore and go to the level J section, right? It doesn't exist, make it authentic. Sometimes kids wanna read a book because it looks interesting. We want them to wanna do that. The leveled books in FPC are only in the guided reading component. Those are the only books that have explicit levels on them, and that's on purpose, okay? We'll talk about how the books were selected for the others in just a bit. So for teachers to understand what makes a B a B, this is where we go to learn that, okay? Then when I turn the page, there's a section called Selecting Goals. The Selecting Goals section tells me what my readers need to know and do next. These, my friends, are our teaching points whether we're doing read-alouds, whether we are, because this can inform everything, right? But when I'm doing my small group guided reading instruction, this is gonna be a really great resource for me. So how can I plan instruction if I don't know what they already can do and what they need to be doing next, okay? That's the whole purpose of this continuum. So the guided reading section is typically the, the most widely used section of the continuum because that really gets us to know each group of readers in our classrooms, okay? So that's just an example of what this looks like in practice and how we interact with and use the continuum. So again, if teachers aren't in the practice of doing that, start there first, okay? Especially if you're using benchmark assessment and you already have access to the continuum. The expanded edition, by the way, the newest part of it is the color coding. The reading behaviors are still in there, in the, in the first edition and the expanded edition. Okay. They also added some new color coding in here 
by the reading behaviors. So for every context in here, if a reading behavior has a red dot next to it, it means it's brand new at that grade level. It means it's the first time kids are being taught at that grade level or that text level. So the red dots stand out to teachers like, oh, okay. So they just went from a level G to a level H. Well, when they were interacting with level G, they weren't required to do this. Like text didn't require them to do that. But now in a level H, they have to know how to do this. So those are the things that make a, an H different from a G. Does that make sense? Okay, so now it's just explicit for teachers. So again, if they're not using it, start there. So for each component of FPC, again, most of them, there's gonna be a section in the continuum. But there are two parts of the continuum that you're gonna see threaded throughout every component of FPC. The first one is writing. In every single component, there is a, there's writing embedded, whether it's interactive writing, independent writing, shared writing, dictation, it just depends on the grade and it depends on the work that's being done in that lesson. The other component is the word study. Now, in FPC, that is a standalone component, but it's also, I call it a hybrid component because there is a, there's direct instruction, but then there's also application across all other components. And when we talk about that, I'll help put that in, in a little bit, you know, clearer perspective for you. So text level gradient, you've heard me talk already about text levels. For those of you who haven't put your eyes on the gradient, that's what it looks like. Let me caution you about getting hung up on the grade levels that are associated with the ranges of text levels. All right, Fountas and Pinnell themselves will tell you those are not set in stone. As a matter of fact, the little lines are, they go in between two letters. They never actually touch a letter. You notice that? Everything Fountas and Pinnell do is on purpose. It's intentional. Here's what they say. These are just general guidelines. If you want to change the expectations in your district, move the lines. Example, Oklahoma City Public Schools. Instead of A to D for kindergarten, they moved it A to E for kindergarten because they want their kindergartners, kindergartners reading at a level E when they leave, not at a level D. Make sense? You have the flexibility to do that. So these, are, these provide general guidelines for us. The other thread that you're gonna find throughout FPC is something I call the wheel, just because it's easier to say than systems of strategic action, right? So in this wheel, and by the way, if you have the continuum, the wheel is on the inside front cover. If you have the guided reading book, the wheel is on the inside front cover. It's kind of a big deal, this wheel. Let me tell you what it, what it is. Starting with the benchmark assessment system, the comprehension conversation is organized around this wheel. It's organized around the three ways of thinking. Thinking within the text, thinking beyond the text, and thinking about the text. Thinking within the text is literal comprehension. Kids can go right to the text, find explicit answers. Thinking beyond the text is inferential comprehension. They gotta read between the lines a little bit, right? But thinking about the text, which by the way is unique to BAS, is moving kids into seeing that text through the eyes of the author. So it moves into author's craft, okay? So we want kids to start, when, when, and our teachers as well, when we look at a book, we don't wanna think of it as I teach a story, because we don't teach stories. We teach kids how to read no matter what that book is about. So we don't teach stories, we teach kids how to read, okay? So throughout FPC, you are gonna see that this wheel is deeply rooted in the discussions of all texts, okay? We wanna push kids to think in all three ways every time we interact with a book, okay? Now for some teachers, guys, and it's, this is not the obvious thing, but for some teachers, it's even hard for them to not look at a book and think of a story. Okay, it's really hard for them to think, you know what, it doesn't matter what this book is about, I have to teach kids how to interact with it, right? That's a shift in thinking for some teachers, okay? Just be, just be aware of that. So these two are integral. The leveling system 
in all other components of FPC. Guided reading, I already shared. Every book has a level explicitly on it. Every lesson plan has the level explicitly on the lesson plan. But let's talk about the other parts. The whole group activities, such as shared reading and interactive read aloud. What that is, is it's an opportunity for kids to learn more about books, but with a high level of teacher support. So the teacher's kind of running the show, right? We're facilitating the discussion, the reading of it, we're talking about it, we're asking the right questions, we're guiding kids to think in those three ways. So there's a high level of teacher support. Anytime there's a high level of teacher support, the text level that is used should fall just outside of the instructional level of most kids sitting in front of you. This is how we push kids to deeper comprehension. So throughout FPC, in these whole group components, shared reading and in, in the interactive read aloud, the text levels are gonna fall just outside of the instructional level of most kids sitting at that grade level, okay? So the texts were selected for absolute clear reasons, all right? None of it was random, not because it was a cute story or, you know, I mean, that, that's important too, right? We want kids to be engaged. And for those of you utilizing BAS or LLI, you already know how engaging the books are, right? So the higher the level of teacher support, the higher text level I can use. When I get to guided reading, I want that to be a just right book, if you will, a book that's gonna present at least one challenge to the group so I can still push them and push them. The independent reading, I, that's why we need to know their independent reading levels so we can help make those decisions. However, during that independent reading time, kids should not be reading just books on their independent level. It's okay if they pick a book on their instructional level, as long as they have somebody to talk with, somebody to interact with, and that's just what we do as readers anyway, or what we should do, all right? So I just wanted to help you understand how the text levels are represented across the other components. All right, now the great thing about the guided reading component, as we all know, if we have our young, our, our little ones, kindergarten, first, second grade, and they're reading well above grade level, right? They're reading at those high text levels. It is so difficult to find appropriate books for those young readers. Sometimes the content is way too mature, right? It's hard to find books that are at high levels written for younger kids. So the way the guided reading component is designed is at each grade, there's gonna be a wide range of text levels. It's not just gonna be the levels on that text level gradient. For example, second grade, the guided reading component has books leveled E to P. And every one of them are appropriate for a kindergarten, first, second, third grader to read. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right, let's talk about Responsive teaching. The responsive teaching cycle goes like this. Step one, I need to know who my readers are. So I'm gonna administer benchmark assessment system so that I can determine what my kids know and are able to do as readers. Once I have that information, I then need to determine what do I need to spend a lot of time on? Like, are they really strong at thinking within? But then when we start asking them to read between the lines, they kind of fall apart a little bit, right? So once I can kind of analyze my class, that's gonna help inform my read alouds and my shared readings. That's gonna help inform conferences that I might have during that independent reading time. It's also gonna inform additional work I can do via guided reading, right? And it is definitely gonna inform my word work that I do across the day. So once I have really taken a look at who my readers are, then I'm gonna to go to this continuum so that I can then learn what my kids need to know and do next so that I know exactly what I should be teaching, okay? Once I've done that, what FPC does for us is it provides us all of the materials to deliver this kind of instruction, all right? So with that being said, let's take a look at the first component of FPC. Now the first thing I want you to think about, and with teachers, this, is, this conversation is absolutely worth having. And in your sampler, I think it's on page four, is it page four maybe on your sampler? You have this diagram, okay? Did I get it right? Thank you. So on page four, you have this classroom diagram. Let me tell you why it's important. 
Every teacher, every coach, every administrator, when you walk into a classroom, you need to look at that classroom and ask yourself two questions. Number one, is this classroom set up to support the teaching that I'm expecting to take place in this room? Number two, is this classroom set up to support the work that I'm expecting my readers to do in this room? Okay? So, in order to answer that, you have to kind of know already what that teaching is going to look like. Okay? So, for example, you will notice that there are three primary areas in that classroom which represent the three instructional contexts in which FPC will be delivered. You have whole group work, you're going to have small group work, and then kids are going to be expected to work independently throughout the day as well. So every classroom should have a whole group area because when I'm doing a read aloud or when I'm doing shared reading, I want them to be as close to the teaching as possible. I don't care how big they are or how smelly they are. Because, you know, fifth grade after PE, whew, right? Okay, so it doesn't matter. I want that to be a very intimate moment. I want them to be as close as possible to the teaching. When you're doing a shared reading with third graders, all eyes are on the same book. They're, all eyes are on the same big book. I want them to be as close to that big book as they possibly can. Okay, so the whole group meeting area is important. The small group meeting area is very important. This is where I'm going to do my guided reading. This is where I'm doing my small group instruction. This is also a place where I can do some small group word work. All right. The thing I always remind teachers of is have your small group area already set up as if you use it all the time. So have the materials that you normally might need already there. Right? Whether you use a basket, a fancy one or not, it doesn't matter to me. Have it ready to go. Okay? The independent areas for students, if I have a classroom where kids are allowed to be on their bellies while they're reading independently, then my room needs to be set up to provide the space for them to do that. Make sense? So the independent work areas are just as important as your whole group meeting area because I don't want kids to be distracted or have an excuse not to read or have an excuse to not do what I'm asking them to do. Okay. So that classroom diagram is absolutely worth a 10-minute conversation about how do, we, how do we set up our classrooms to support teaching and learning. Okay? So let's start off by looking at our first whole group component, which is the interactive read aloud. Now the interactive read aloud is the only FPC component that spans pre-K to grade 6. So this component is pre-K to grade 6. Fountas and Pinnell also say that it is the heart of our reading instruction. It is the most important part of our day, is the interactive read aloud. The reason for that is because everything that we are doing in an interactive read aloud sets kids up to be able to do the work the rest of the day. All right, there are three big kinds of work that we do in a read aloud. First of all, notice the lead in is called interactive read aloud, right? That signals that we're kind of talking, we're doing stuff together. Okay, big work number one in an interactive read aloud. Comprehension, comprehension, comprehension. Big work number two is learning how to have structured talk about books. Learning how to talk about books. Right? And then in our interactive read alouds, and by the way, it's really important that kids are close to this teaching because, hey, we're all in this together. We're learning how to do all of this together, right? So not only am I deepening my understanding and my comprehension on a higher level text than I would be able to interact with otherwise, and not only am I learning how to talk with you about a book, right? But I'm also learning, big work number three, how books work. How do books work? Right? Because books are way more than stories. If I'm an author, I look at books very differently than if I'm just a lover of series books. You follow me? And our kids, we're expecting them to both be readers and writers. So we utilize all of these opportunities to teach both. Okay? So let's take a look at it. The interactive read aloud comes with 120 titles per grade. There's no overlap in title. 
So kindergarten teachers have their own 120 titles. First grade teachers have their own. And by the way, that really is a great thing because then there's no more arguing of, no, second grade can't use that book. We use that book, right? I know when I was a teacher, that happened all the time. Okay? You know what I'm talking about, right? So every grade has their own collection. Every title comes with a lesson plan. This is the beautiful thing about the lesson plan. Every, for every single teacher, whether they are brand new to the work or whether they're highly skilled at doing an interactive read aloud, the lesson plans are designed to provide the right amount of PD for every teacher. So if you're really good at doing it, you're going to get some really good ideas. If you've never done this before in your life, you're going to be able to do it step by step by step, and your kids will never know that you've never done that before, right? So the great thing, about, and we're going to take a look at a lesson plan. As a matter of fact, you also have a sample of a lesson plan in your sampler. So for every component, you have this information in your sampler. All right. So with the interactive read aloud, you have 120 titles and you have a lesson plan for every one of them. But the second piece of this, which is going to be new to almost every teacher, is Fountas and Pinnell took these 120 titles and they organized them into 25 text sets. So now we don't just teach a book, we teach four books at a time. Okay, so let's talk about this work. The way this goes, there are four to six books in every text set. So four to six of the 120 books are clumped together and put into this text set. Those four books have something in common. It could be genre, it could be same author, right? So it could also be structure or organization, right? So for example, one of the first grade text sets contains these four books. All four of these books are nonfiction, but what they have in common is the way they're organized. All four of these are question answer books, okay? So, the books that make up the interactive read aloud are all trade books, so you may already have some of these books, which is really cool because then you'll get an additional one, and that never hurts anybody's feelings, right? So, for example, these four titles. Each day, I'm going to do a read aloud using one of the titles. But as I'm doing the read aloud, I'm constantly connecting this title to yesterday's title and the two titles coming up. I'm constantly connecting it. Hey, do you remember when we read that in science? Remember that book was also organized this way? There's constant connections to other books. Okay? So the lesson plan, it tells you everything to do in an interactive read aloud, but it also gives the teacher the language of how do I connect these books together? What does that language sound like when I'm not talking about a specific book, but I'm talking about a group of books, right? That language sounds a little bit differently. So the lesson plan is organized and written so that teachers have that language. Okay, so let's take a closer look. This is the tool that comes with the text set. Okay, now remember, if you have folks who are highly skilled at doing an interactive read aloud, this, this part of it might be new to them. Okay, so Fountas and Pinnell, in all of their wisdom, they said, hey, we need to provide a scaffold for folks who are new to this work. So this inquiry overview card allows the teacher to know how to instruct using a text set. So on the front of this card, it's going to identify the books in my text set. But then it's going to give me some information about the text set. Now you'll notice, you see the little blue tiles? Those are other titles in the read aloud that are also organized question answer that you could easily insert into the text set, okay? Now, other inquiry overview cards might show books from the shared reading collection or from, you know, wherever, because the deal is, is they want teachers to constantly be making connections from book to book to book, because remember, we teach reading, we don't teach stories, right? So there's a constant ongoing connection all the time so that we never isolate a title, all right? Then it's gonna help us as teachers think across the books. What, do, what does it sound like 
to think beyond the text when I'm talking about four texts, right? What does it sound like? Give me some language. How do I model this for kids? Then it's going to give us the essential question. And this, this inquiry overview card is organized this way because the, the way, the, the, um, the commonality of these titles all centers on structure and organization. If it was genre, the inquiry overview card is going to have different parts. It's not going to look like this because you're going to be doing different work if you're talking about genre. If it's author, the inquiry overview card is going to look even different than, the, than those two because of what it is, you know, because of the work we're doing with the text set. But the inquiry overview card is that teacher tool to help train us know how to, how to instruct using a text set. Okay? But you'll notice there's an essential question and then stemming from the essential questions are these three big ideas. We want kids to get the big picture using the collection of books. Okay? What it does then, if you flip this card over, is they show us how to take those questions and turn them, in, I mean those big ideas and turn them into questions. And then from there they provide us with projects for kids to explore the text set. So this whole idea of working with text sets in an interactive read aloud is all about exploration and discovery. We want kids to be curious about books. We want them to be inquiring about how does this work? How does this, is this one the same as this one? How are they different? Why did the author do this? Because in some books, the authors do question, answer. Other books, authors do question, clues, answer, right? Okay, so it really allows kids to explore multiple titles that have something in common. So these projects for exploration are included. Some of them are whole group, some of them can be done small group. I could see teachers taking these and put them on choice boards. There's lots of different ways teachers are going to be able to use the projects. Typically within the projects you're going to find some writing, some kind of writing, right? But the, the projects themselves are varied, so it's going to differ from each title, all right? So that's the text set component. The lesson plan for FPC is really a file folder. It truly is a file folder, okay? The front matter is what I call teacher matter. It helps the teacher be more informed about the text they're using to do the read aloud, all right? So it's gonna give us the summary of the book, message of the book, but then they've taken the goals right out of the continuum. And it, as a matter of fact, it says, Think about the behaviors your children currently control. Then go to the grade one interactive read aloud section of the continuum and select goals. You may want to consider these. That's how it's worded, okay? So those goals were lifted exactly off of the page of the interactive read aloud grade one of the continuum, all right? This bottom section, and notice this bottom section is shaded. It's the only part of the lesson plan, well, the first part of the lesson plan that's shaded. This part is going to be very easy for teachers to overlook because they aren't going to know the value of it right away. Because, you know, as teachers, we want to go right to the lesson, right? Show me what I'm doing when I'm teaching. But this section is really important because it does some training for us. It helps us think about the genre of the book. Sometimes that takes us a little deeper than fiction or nonfiction because there's different kinds of fiction, right? There's different structures of, a non of, of nonfiction. Then it talks to us about how that book works. Remember, part of the big work of an interactive read aloud is to learn how books work. And then I'm gonna so, have something for kids to turn and talk about, something for them to turn and think out loud about, okay? I need to do that multiple times through the reading of the book so that they get better and better at learning how to talk about books. So I'm going to introduce it, then I'm going to read it. After we read it, we're going to talk about it. Now this is the great part. Remember the wheel? Remember I told you it's kind of a big deal, that wheel, right? It's kind of a big deal. Here's the thinking within, beyond, and about that is specific to this title. So this, this the little table is going to do two things for teachers. Number one, it's going to help them get better and more skilled at recognizing evidence of kids thinking in, this three, in these three ways. But number two, it's giving them explicit, specific language for modeling thinking in these three ways. Okay? So, introduce. We're going to read and we're going to discuss it. But then, 
They give me some ideas for how I can get kids to respond to the book, right? Some of this can be done, again, it can be whole group, small group, independent, up to the teacher how it's used. These activities are, there's just a wide variety. Sometimes there's art, sometimes there's role play. In this particular example, there's bookmaking, there's interactive writing. So there's just a lot of different ways to have kids respond to texts. This, this lesson plan gives you three of those ways. Feel free to add more, right? Um, but then, when I flip over my lesson plan on the backs, oh, by the way, notice in this copy that I have, the margins are gray. You see that? For every part of the lesson plan, they're going to give me one or two suggestions or one or two ideas for supporting English language learners. Now, here's what I tell folks. Just because it says suggestions for supporting English language learners doesn't mean that it's not good for all kids. So here's what I would coach teachers to do. If you have a, a particular, if you have a group of kids who have particularly weak, let's say, word study skills, right? These suggestions are worth you putting your eyes on because they might give you a couple of alternatives, something else you can add into your narrative when you're doing that part of the lesson that's going to benefit those kiddos. So just because it's labeled support for ELLs doesn't mean that it's restricted use only for ELLs, right? It's just some, some, most often it's just good practice for all kids, okay? When I flip this over, it's going to give me even more ideas for how I can use this title later in the day or at another point in time, maybe next week, maybe two weeks from now. For example, let me tell you what I can see most folks doing with this. The revisiting the text gives you some explicit work that you could use very easily in small groups. So for example, notice there's a vocabulary option up there. There's a comprehension option. There's a print and text features option, right? So if I have a group of kids that are particularly, let's say vocabulary, I have to do just tons of vocabulary work with them all the time, then I can use that idea. I can use this text just with that group of kids using that idea, right? The point is, is the teachers will have the text to use any point in time for any instruction that they feel it lends itself to. Does that make sense? But the revisiting part of the lesson plan is going to give them additional ideas of how to utilize that book. Okay. So after that section, it, this is where it gives them the language for how to connect this book to the other books in the text set. So it gives them the explicit language. The last section of every lesson plan is the assessment section. Okay? So the assessment section for the interactive read aloud, the primary assessment is observation. Now teachers don't automatically know how to do that really well. Right? Sometimes it's a little scary and overwhelming because you don't really know how to do this, like how do I find evidence of these things. Okay? So for teachers who need a little more help in knowing how to find evidence, it will refer them to specific pages in the prompting guides. Now the prompting guides, if you're using LLI, you have prompting guides. Okay. Prompting guide two is all about comprehension. It's all about comprehension. This is organized around the wheel. So for each section on that wheel, there's a corresponding tab in the prompting guide. Okay. It is absolutely nothing more than a list of good questions to ask kids during a discussion. That's all it is. But the cool thing about it is some of the sections include questions specific to nonfiction titles, right? So it includes questions for both fiction and nonfiction because those questions should be, some of them should be different, right, from fiction to nonfiction. So it will refer you to specific pages to prompting guides. Okay, now the online resources that come with FPC will have record keeping tools in them for teachers. So for example, one of the things I haven't shared with you about FPC is for each one of those little tiles, right, FPC is modular. You can get all of the tiles or you can just get one of the tiles. So let's say the only thing you got was the interactive read aloud, right, then you're going to get access to online resources to accompany your interactive read-alouds. 
within those online resources, you're going to have lots of other teachers are going to have lots of other resources. There's a parent letter, but there's also that record keeping form specific to the observations that you should be doing that are part of the work you're doing in an interactive read aloud. So the tools for helping teachers know what that looks like are included. Okay. So that's the interactive read aloud. Now I'm going to pick it up and zoom a little faster because I've given you big picture of a lesson plan folder, right? So what I'm going to do from here on is talk about the differences in those lesson plans for the other components. All right? So shared reading. Shared reading, you'll notice, is a pre-K to grade three component. Now the big work around shared reading is language, language, language. It's word work in the context of a book, right? Shared reading is all about words, how words go together, and the language. It's, all, it's a very language-based activity. So when teachers say, why do I need to do both of these? Because you're doing two different kinds of work, okay? So a shared, the shared reading component of FPC, and by the way, by nature, a shared reading also differs from an interactive read aloud because in shared reading, I'm going to use the same title across multiple days. Each day that I use that book, I'm doing different work. And the lesson plans are organized to support that. All right? But the way the component is structured, first of all, these are all original titles. You can't find these books anywhere except shared reading FPC, just like BAS and LLI. Those are original, right? This component has shared reading titles. In your sampler, under the inside front cover, you have two examples. You have two of the shared reading books for that grade level. Again, this is whole group. It makes use of both fiction and nonfiction titles. Okay? The other thing about this, because these are original titles, Fountas and Pinnell also have provided audio files for every title. Okay? So you get a big book, six copies of the book, smaller copies of the book, and a lesson plan and an audio file for every title. Now the way the titles, you notice that it said 200 titles that span pre-K to three, so let me give you the breakdown. Pre-K will get 30 titles. Kindergarten and first grades will get 65 titles each. Second grade will get 30 titles, and third grade gets 10 titles. Okay. Now the reason there are fewer titles, like I said, is because we use the same title across multiple days when we're doing shared reading. Plus, teachers will also want to use things like chants or song lyrics or poems and things like that to do some, um, to do some shared readings with. All right. Now the packaging that you see is exactly the packaging that comes with it. So for pre-K to grade two, they get that cute little rolly cart that yes, it has wheels. It's not big, it's only about this tall, like waist high, right? And, it's, and you can see the width of it is just about the width of standard big books, okay? So that is the pack. Third grade gets a nice little canvas bag with their big book uh, materials because they have 10 titles, all right? But I'm, I want to show you the differences in the lesson plan for a shared reading to illustrate the difference of the kind of work you're doing in a shared reading. So all of this, what you're looking at, is what happens the very first day you use the title. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce the, the book. The introduction feels different here than it does in an interactive read aloud because you're introducing a shared reading title based on the language and based on the words that you're going to focus on. So your introduction is different, right? After I introduce it, I'm going to read it out loud. The kids are listening and watching. So what I'm reading from is the big book. I have the big book sitting up here. It's on my easel or wherever you're going to have it. And as I'm reading it, I might be pointing to the words depending on the grade level I'm working with, right? I'm also providing for them a model of how my voice matches what the page looks like. So I'm going to read it out loud first. The second reading, and it tells teachers how to go about doing this first reading. The second reading then, I'm going to invite kids to read it with me. So I've introduced it, I've read it, now I'm going to invite them to read it with me. 
Now, what's really cute, especially in those primary grades, is when kids start reading it with you, it really just sounds like a collective you know, mumble. Because a lot of the words, they're not going to know. Because remember, these titles are just outside of the instructional level of most kids. So it might sound like this. As you're reading, the rest of it sounds like the, right? And that's okay. That's what we want, right? Even if they're, even if they're faking it till they make it, that's all right. We want them as they're trying out the words, right? We're pointing to them. They're trying them out right along with me, all right? So that happens the first time. After we do that, and we might even read it again. I might want to do that with them twice. That's, teachers can decide that. But then we're going to have a discussion about the book. Even in the shared readings, the discussions are organized around the three ways of thinking. I constantly want to push kids to think across a book in the, uh, all three ways every time. All right? Then, after we discuss it, you're going to see a section that says revisit the text. Now, the revisiting of the text is the work I can do on the subsequent days. So from here, I'm going to decide where do I need to go next with my class, and I can pick something here or, or something else in the shared reading section of the continuum. Now, if you have three first grade classrooms, it is absolutely appropriate and it should be absolutely encouraged that what they do on subsequent days with that title is dependent on, uh, only upon the kids sitting in front of them, not what the person next door to them is doing. Teachers need to be able to differentiate what they do in their shared readings based on what the kids are sitting in front of them need. That's why this is organized around options. Okay, so keep that in mind. It is totally appropriate on days two, three, or four of a shared reading that every first grade class is doing something different with that book. And Pam, that's just to chime in here, I'm Matt from Solon, and um, we're just digging into not all the components yet, but that's just the shift that you talked about is a big shift from our teachers. We're moving away from a 2008 Basel where it just says on week one, you're doing this, week two, you're doing this, week three, you're doing this, and now there's all these options like, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. This idea of we might be using different books on the same day. That's is a right. Big shift, it is. But it's appropriate, and we're trying to help our teachers understand. Right. And, and it's really, it's, it's a little scary at first, right? It's, it's almost scary for the teachers because they don't want to do it wrong. That's why it's scary. They don't want to mess it up or do it wrong, but giving them permission, hey, it is totally appropriate. If I walk in your classroom and then I go next door and I go two doors down the hallway, that you might even be using the same title, but everybody's doing something different with it. I would expect to see that in my classrooms. If everybody were doing the same thing every day, I would start having questions of my own. Does that make sense? So it is very much a, a different way of thinking for our teachers. So also in the shared reading, on the back, it gives you ideas for how we can have kids respond to the text. But the independent reading section of this lesson plan is what gives teachers ideas of how to use those six small copies and the audio file at another time of day. So for example, if you have teachers who, who implement centers in their classroom, then one of the centers could be a listening center where they use the audio file and the six copies for kids to hear yet another model of fluency. They follow along as it's being read. Right Now, the cool thing about what they've done is the shared reading audio files have different voices. So they're not hearing the same voice read every title. Okay? Because it's all about having a model of fluency. Think about it. It's a language-based activity. Okay? So we need to inundate kids with what does this, we see what it looks like, but when I read that, how should that sound? And more importantly, how does that help me understand the message of what I'm reading? Okay? So another thing that happens in shared reading is this idea of punctuation. It's like, why do, why do authors put all those little weird marks everywhere? Well, they're there for a reason, and they help us have better understanding of the author's message. So yeah, they're there for a reason. Let me show you how to read and, and use them when you're reading, okay? So that is shared reading. The other part of it is still connecting it to other books. And then the last part again is assessment. And again, the primary assessment is observation with shared reading. Now for teachers, you have to make sure that you explicitly communicate that the assessment part of an interactive read aloud and a shared reading does not mean that as soon as you do it, you start assessing kids. 
What that means is these are the things you need to be looking for to make sure kids are understanding and doing across the day, across the week. So it's not like a Friday test that they're going to give. It's not the unit test that you follow me. That also is a very big shift of thinking because they have to start relying on their skills and their own knowledge of what they should be seeing kids do. And a lot of them are not in the practice of that. So that can be scary, okay? All right, so that's shared reading. Those are our two primary whole group components. The next one is our phonics spelling and word study. This is more of a hybrid component because there is whole group direct instruction, but then there's small group application. There's also out of text teaching and in text teaching. So your interactive read aloud and your shared reading titles are going to be your mentor text for this component. So you're using those titles multiple times to serve multiple purposes. However, let's say you only get the phonics spelling word study component. The lesson plans tell you if you don't have the books, that's okay. Pick books that have this, this, and this. So it even helps teachers with that, okay? So, like I said, I call this a hybrid component because it's kind of a mishmash of everything. You have your, your whole group where I'm gonna do some out of text teaching, then I'm gonna do some in text application, but then the primary work that I'm gonna be doing in my shared readings is gonna reinforce a lot of what we're doing in our word work, all right? It's organized around nine categories of learning. And one of the things that they did with this component is in the literacy continuum, just almost right in the middle of the book, there's a little thin section for phonics, spelling, and word study, right? Well, what they did, it's almost like they took that section right out of the middle of it and they developed a new comprehensive phonics, spelling, and word study guide. Now, let me tell you about this little, this little guy right here. This spans pre-K to eight. This can be a scope and sequence for all word work across your building, this book. Now, the phonics, spelling, and word study component in FPC is going to span grades K-5, okay? But if you're a pre-K to 6 school, if you're a K to 6 school, that sort of thing, right? It's really hard for intermediate, upper grades teachers to know what you mean when you say we should be doing word work. Well, what do you mean? Vocabulary? You mean spelling? What are you talking about? Yes, all of that. But they don't understand the behaviors they should be teaching for. Right? Usually when you say word work, everybody thinks phonics. Okay? So that is not entirely true. So it's organized around nine categories. For each of those categories in this comprehensive guide, they have a section. And what they do in this section is they identify the behaviors to teach for. Then they give them the instructional language. What does it sound like to teach that? But then the table spans pre-K to eight, and it shows teachers where that behavior should be taught, what grade levels. But the cool thing is, is they expanded each grade level into beginning, middle, and end of year. So I might be responding, it might be a fourth grade thing I need to teach, but do I teach it in the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, the end of the year? So this book identifies that. So for those of you who have grades three, four, five in your buildings, three, four, five, six in your buildings, right? This resource is a standalone. You can get this outside of everything, okay? This is a great place to start. It's what, like 1950 or something? It's like, I promise, it's so ridiculous. But this is going to help those upper grades teachers know exactly what they should be teaching in terms of word work. All right? So that's a really nice thing that they've done there for us. All right. So the other thing I want to show you is that in our whole group, part of the phonics, spelling, and word study, I'm, again, I'm going to be doing some out of text, right? But then the lesson plan for the phonics, spelling, and word study show across all of the other components how this, this particular lesson is embedded, right? How do we reinforce it in shared reading? How do we reinforce it in, in our interactive read alouds and so forth? So that part of the lesson plan looks like this. It's called Connect Learning Across Contexts, and it'll show you. In shared reading, you're going to do this. In the read aloud, you can do this and so forth. Okay. So our next one is reading mini lessons. Now the mini lessons are not going to be available for any grade until this coming fall. But the way they're going to be structured, you're going to get one book of mini lessons per grade level. 
Each book contains 150 mini lessons. The mini lessons are organized into four categories. So you're going to have some management mini lessons where you're going to teach those routines and structures and those ongoing habits, right? You're going to have some literary analysis mini lessons where we get kids to think a little deeper, interact on, you know, really analyze across texts, if you will. We're going to have some strategies and skills mini lessons and then writing about reading mini lessons. All right, now within each of these four categories, they're then going to clump some lessons together under these umbrella topics. For example, kindergarten, literary analysis, many lessons. There are two of them that help us teach kindergartners how characters work in books, right? So if I wanted to do some, uh, do some work around this theme of characters, then I can pull those two mini lessons and deliver them back to back. Make sense? So they've done that for every grade level, all right? The next component is our guided reading component. The guided reading is made up of all original titles. So this is our, you know, it's a small group component, but it's our second component that has all original titles. The way this works is these books are designed to be placed into a common book room for teachers, not to be housed in classrooms. If you get one guided reading collection, grades K to six, if you just get one per grade, you're gonna end up with 50 titles at every text level. 50 A's, 50 L's, 50 M's, 50 R's, 50 titles at every text level. Because these are original titles, you have two of them on the inside back cover of your sampler, okay? But the really cool part about this is you, you're going to get a lesson plan to go with every title, but you also get the reading record that goes with every title. So this is your progress monitoring piece that is the same assessment tool that your benchmark assessment uses and that LLI uses. So this is your progress monitoring for your, for your tier one kiddos, your core reading instruction. Okay, so you get six copies of each, each title, you get a lesson plan and you get the, the reading record. All right, you also get access again, of course, to online resources. So for the guided reading, there's a couple of things, and by the way, on the front le of the lesson plan for this, those 10 text characteristics are there, and they show you why that book, like this one, Chester Sweaters, a level J. Those 10 text characteristics on that lesson plan tell teachers why that book is a level J book, okay? But then when I open it up, there's always, th usually, not always, there's usually three things missing from a guided reading lesson. One is how, how we have kids reading. Two is there's usually not a teaching point, right? And three, there's often no word work being done. Well, with FPC, the lesson plans are going to teach teachers what guided reading really is. Guided reading is not just small groups. It really has a specific structure and specific parts to it, okay? So let's look at that. The first thing we do is introduce the book. Nothing new there. Notice how brief, though, the reading the text is. Do you see that on the lesson plan? The reason for that is this. If I'm a first grade teacher, the reading of this book is going to go like this. Here I am with my small group. Every kid is reading that book out loud at their own pace at the same time. It's not popcorn reading. It's not round robin. I want to hear every kid reading that book out loud at their own pace. My job then is to listen and coach, listen and coach, listen and coach right? So that every kid gets a second or, or, or 10 of my time listening to them read and offering coaching if necessary, all right? So that's usually the first thing in a guided reading lesson that is not done correctly, I should say. So after we read, then we're going to talk about the text. Now the discussion, the, the discussing the text, again, is going to be organized around the three ways of learning or of thinking. All right, so again, it's gonna give teachers the modeling part. The second part that's usually missing in a guided reading lesson is that there should be an explicit teaching point. The discussion of the text is not the teaching point. That's the application of everything we're learning, right? The teaching point is explicitly on the lesson plan, but this is what it says. The directions tell teachers Select a teaching point that's going to be most helpful to that group. 
if you aren't sure or if it's appropriate, use this teaching point. So for teachers who don't know how to do guided reading the right way, if they just follow the lesson plans, then they're giving their kids what their kids need. Now, the next part of it, which is the third part that's usually missing, is the word work. The word work in a guided reading lesson does not necessarily have anything to do with the text that we just read and talked about. Let me put this in perspective. The word work in a guided reading lesson should be specific to the text level the kids are currently working at, not the actual text they just read. So if I go to that guided reading section and I go to a level J, and I look under words, right? I look for those teaching points that are gonna help kids not necessarily decode, but solve words as they're reading this level of text. That's the kind of word work that we need to be doing in the guided reading. So it should be level specific, not, not necessarily text specific. Does that make sense? Okay, that's usually confusing to teachers. They wanna make everything about the book, right? They wanna make everything about the book and everything about the story. If it lends itself, fine, use the book, no problem. But teachers don't have to have text-specific word work in this part of the guided reading lesson. Okay, now that might freak some teachers out, so use discretion in who you share that with. Right, let's get them doing it right. The first, let's get them doing it right and doing it well, and then we can throw that on them, okay? All right, so the word work in guided reading is really specific to the text level, not the text itself. All right, then we have the writing about reading, and then we have the assessment, which like I said, the reading record comes with it. All right, that's guided reading. Now, let's talk about book clubs. Book clubs are, are a small group component. Again, they're not gonna be ready until fallish, but it's really exciting stuff. This is a K-6 component. Grades K-3 are, are going, sorry, I went, ahead too quickly, I apologize about that. But grades K-3 are gonna have 32 titles, 48 titles for grades four and six. These books are also organized into text sets. So at any given time, my, when I have book clubs going, which by the way, should be about once a month, right? Book clubs about once a month. When I have book clubs going, the books that my, my different clubs are reading different books, but they might all have something in common. It could be author, it could be Organization, right? It could be genre, something like that, all right? So they get six copies of each and they get this facilitator's card that helps them know how to teach kids to eventually run their own book clubs. So it gives the teacher the language and the different parts and the know-how. On the back, the discussion of that book, again, it's organized around the three ways of thinking. Oh, sorry. There's writing about reading. The summarize and evaluating really is all about how do I teach kids how to close a book club and plan for the next book club, okay? So setting goals and then setting the, the, the timeline and when we're gonna meet again. Then the last instructional component is the independent component of independent reading. The independent reading collection is designed for teachers to put right on their bookshelves right into their classroom library. Not, to, not necessarily enough books to serve as a standalone classroom library, but to be inserted right within the library that you already have started, okay? The great thing about these, these are trade titles per grade, and you can see 150 for our lower grades, 200 for our upper grades, but the tool that comes with these titles is what makes it so powerful. I can tell you as a classroom teacher, there wasn't a single year where I could, set, where I could tell you that I have read every book on my shelf, right? We don't have time most of the time. Plus we get new books and you know, things are happening. But with this collection, teachers are going to get a conferring card for every title so that they can still have student conferences and they can still hold kids accountable for that independent reading even though they haven't read the books. So what this card does is it makes every teacher sound smart and makes every teacher sound like they've already read the books, right? So the front is gonna give teacher the book, you know, they're gonna give us the book information. Book talk, a summary of the book, and talking about the book and the print features. But when I turn it over, it's going to give me conferring prompts organized around the three ways of thinking. It's going to give me writing about reading prompts organized around the three ways of thinking. But my favorite part about this conferring card is on the very bottom where it says, hey, 
if you really liked this book, you might want to check out these other two books. And guess where those other two books are? On your shelves. They're part of the collection, right? So it really makes us sound way smart, like we've read every book. Like when kids say, what do you like to do? Well, I just read all the time, right? I just read all the time. But this really empowers teachers to continue their student conferences or to start their student conferences because it gives them the language and the, no, the information about the book to allow them to have those conversations, okay? So those are the seven instructional components. The assessment pieces, again, you have observation, you have your reading record, right? And in the system guide that comes with the grade level collection, there's a tab in this system guide that's all about assessment. So it takes, and that's actually where this, this um, screenshot came from, was from that assessment guide, but it'll walk you through how to observe in each of the components, you know, the, the reading record and that sort of thing. And remember, for each of the components, there are, there are recording forms in the online resources. So, the online resources are going to be really great for folks. There's going to be labels there for teachers. There are going to be, again, parent letters for each component. You have different general resources. Your record keeping forms are there. But again, it's going to be specific and unique to the component itself. So I have talked a whole bunch at you. So I'm going to stop talking now. And even for our friends on Zoom, um, I want to open it up to some questions before I turn it over to Solon to, to share with you and answer. And, and you guys, please chime in. If they're asking questions and you're at that point in time, please jump in. So who has questions? It's a lot of information, right? A lot of information. I would probably need processing time. Yeah. But if you have questions, you're invited to, to ask. So you're welcome to come up and like touch these, right? Come up and look at them because I know that's what I, I, I would need. So you talked about the phonics, spelling, or the component that it could be something that you could purchase individually. Are each of these components something that you can purchase individually? Each of them. Every I mean every one of them. So and the and the good thing about that is is you don't have to get the same one for every grade. So if you just wanted phonics and shared reading for kindergarten, you wanted shared reading and interactive read aloud for first grade, if you wanted guided reading for third grade, it is absolute mix and match. It's modular in nature. You get what you need. So your entry point into this is totally based on what your need is at your school or in your district. What else can I answer for you? The part that, that typically is most missing, and, and I've heard Fountas and Pinnell say this, if folks don't know where to start, if they don't know where their entry point is, take them to the interactive read aloud. The reason for that, and as a matter of fact, in the...
you're doing. Page 590 is a guided reading self-assessment and it is pretty comprehensive, okay? There's also a study guide at fountasandpinnell.com for both the literacy continuum and the guided reading books. So tap into those if you need them. Correlation to the Common Core Standards has been done to the literacy continuum because that's the curriculum for FPC. That full document can also be found at fountasandpinnell.com in their resource library. Okay? All right, let's hear it. Yes. So typically with grammar, well, I could answer that in about four different ways. So let me think how I want to construct that. All right. FPC is a way of teaching reading across the day. Okay? It's a way of teaching reading. So what teachers have to decide is, am I going to teach grammar in text? Am I going to teach grammar isolated out of text? Or am I going to do both? So if you're going to teach it in text, then every component is going to allow you to reinforce and, and, and do that right? in the context of a book. If you're going to teach it out of text, you are going to have to probably figure out what, it, what specifically you are needing to teach and how you're going to do that. There's not a grammar component necessarily to FPC because that's typically done with our writing instruction, our explicit writing instruction. But the phonics, spelling, and word study component could be another area where we could do some mini lessons, that sort of thing, around grammar. So if, in order to teach grammar, I advocate for both in-text and out-of-text. Both are necessary. Any other questions from anybody? Because I want to turn it over to Solon so you can pick their brains and hear what they have to say. And to our Zoom friends, thank you so much for joining us. You're more than welcome. We'll, we'll stay plugged in so you can hear Solon as well um, and continue to ask questions if you have them. So guys, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, hi, I'm Matt Townsley. I'm the curriculum director in Solon. And with me is Jody Rickles, our elementary principal, and Emily Moser. She's one of our instructional coaches. And a couple years ago, we um, were probably, like some of you, didn't really have a whole lot of um, focus on where we wanted to go with our reading materials and our reading instruction. There's obviously a huge emphasis right now in Iowa in the area of uh, literacy. And so, like many of you, we're really trying to get after it in a way that was um, very practical for our teachers. Um, stretches our teachers also a little bit, as you heard today from Pam, uh, but also is, uh, has a very much of a evidence base behind it. Uh, we tr are transitioning away from a 2008 copyright, um, other vendor kind of basal approach uh, to Fountas and Pinnell classroom materials. And so we purchased back in September uh, as much of the stuff as we could. So when you saw the little like, timeline, all of the stuff that was available in August 2018, uh, we bought it. So our Board of Education approved over $100,000 worth of materials um, for us to purchase. Um, prior to that, we had purchased the uh, units of study writing for grades K-6, eventually 7-8 as well. So our year two units of study writing, so you, you heard Pam kind of talk about there's no writing really involved in all of this, and so that's our writing component. Uh, so our, our, especially our elementary teachers have been very busy uh, the past couple years getting after it. Um, so the components that we've really got into this year in FPC are uh, guided reading, the most, would you say? Right, because we were dabbling in that yes. um, component anyway, and that was the most familiar to us. So, yeah, so what we did kind of last year as we geared up to this, I mean, we were thinking, we, we talked to Beth and had heard about Fountas and Pinnell classroom as being a possibility, and so what Jody did, she did a really great job at our elementary, was starting to prime the pump with our elementary teachers, just what's guide reading look like? Many of them had heard about it, but kind of, you know, all across the board, different understandings of what it is. So we started uh, creating some uh, thoughts around what it is, what it's common not, language. Uh, common language, you know, what would kind of a typical guide reading lesson look like. And so that's kind of the pump that we've been priming all along the way. And now for our K2 teachers, they're like, oh my gosh, we've got lesson folders, like, oh, this is awesome. For our uh, grades three and four teachers, they're, we're, they're ready for August of 2018 and 2019 to, to play out. So, Jordy, what would you add right now as far as how it's gone so far for us in Solon? Well, and I think it depends. You heard Pam talk about Carlisle. They had a great understanding of interactive reading. So it just, or in, that's where you have to decide where you want to start. Um, we also have a great understanding because of the writing curriculum we've um, 
adopted of many lessons yes. and that conferring and those kinds of things. So then it doesn't seem as daunting Correct. as just buying all the materials and slapping in front of teachers and saying, next fall, you're going to be doing this. You've got the summer to open the boxes. It took a l slow rollout, I guess is what we would call it. But yeah, you got on it. the other hand, um, the materials weren't ready either. So it was a great opportunity. So we just slowly decided what we wanted to put in place and have that common language, common understanding. And then it didn't seem as daunting, even though there's a lot of things and it still is, can be overwhelming on certain days. Um, Emily hears more from teachers, I think, than I do sometimes. <laughs> what, I mean, what resources have, have we depended upon f from the instructional coaching perspective to get the answers to our teachers? Emily, I know you like webinars. Go ahead and talk on that. Yeah, um, they offer a lot of webinars. So we've purchased some. They're a lot on just our website in general. Um, when you go on there, you'll just see the little like component pictures, and they'll have like 15 to 30 minute um, videos just as a really good overview, and we use those a lot for the teachers when we were kind of leading PD with that, and that was really helpful. And I think we had given teachers a continuum last year at the end of the year, and it was kind of one of those that we knew it was coming, but it went kind of up on the shelf, and now it's been, hey, just like she had said, you go to this all the time to really guide your instruction to figure out when you have questions, let's go look at what level they're at and figure that out together and try to guide instruction that way. If you do decide to purchase the kind of the entire package like we did, the system guide has been really a helpful resource. As Questions have come up. We've kind of funneled some through Pam and Beth and others, and they've said, well, have you checked system guide page, whatever? And we're like, oh, man. So that's really kind of grounded us in the system guide, too, to get the big picture of the whole program. Um, the continuum the continue and the system guide have been two just awesome resources for us for obviously different reasons. The literacy continuum is included in the benchmark assessment. So we ordered those. They were available, and every teacher got a benchmark assessment box and then therefore have their own copy of the literacy continuum. Which was like it was great. a great, we didn't know at the time, it was one of the better things that we did. Mm -hmm. If you don't already have that in place, it's a really great, like you said, a great first place to start as well. I, 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 guess, I guess I'd just add one more thing, unless there's other questions, is that um, because we just kind of jumped into it, um, you know, being, there, it's not like we could ask questions to the neighboring school district, and so we had to have someone to ask questions to, and um, the support that we've been provided has been really helpful. There's been, you know, Skypes or Zooms that we've had a chance to talk with, you know, Pam and others. Um, you know, if I don't know who to ask, sometimes, one of our other instructional coaches, or Jody, or Emily, will just funnel a question to me, and I funnel it to Beth, who finds the right person, to, often to Pam, or to someone like that, to funnel it through. And so, to us, that's just been really helpful. And, um, I don't know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but sometimes when you go purchase just something off the shelf, there isn't that personalized support, and I felt like we've received that, which to us has been just as helpful as having materials that align with a philosophy that we believe in. So, um, I can't say enough good things about that.
where we just connect Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri educators together um, because we know it's just so great to be able to bounce ideas off mm -hmm. people. And there are, you know, the Facebook pages of all of these, you know, things. Yeah, good point. Really, good point. Really, really great from what we hear from all of you is just connecting each other close by, like, you know, you're working on the same standards and all of that, so you've got the same things going on. It's just we're trying to put together a way for you all to stay connected. So we hope that we, we see it yeah. as like maybe an FTC group and maybe a Lucy Calkins group or something like that, or maybe just one new group and the topics all connect. So that's coming sometime soon. That'll be great. We do use the Facebook page every so often too. It just is a little slower depending on when people get on and answer everything. That would be um, great, a little more instantaneous too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And those of you who are using LOI, you know how kids love those books. Like they go bonkers over the books, right? Um, well, some of the characters in your LOI books are back in your guided reading book. So <laughs> Millie is, is going to be a character in the guided reading. And by the way, Millie is Irene Fountas' dog in real life. Like Millie's a real dog. Um, but Millie now has a blog. So the kids can go on and blog with oh, Melly, oh, and Melly answers back. So if you go to foundersandpinnell.com, you'll find Melly's blog. So that's just another great writing connection oh, in conjunction with what they're doing in reading and learning about characters. One thing I noticed what Kat said and um, what I completely appreciate is that you know, these are near materials that align with what you believe, and it's just hard to find that. Mm -hmm. but I mean, when you believe it, there's really, you can't, you know, fake it with any catalog, if you're a curriculum person like me, just pick the next catalog that comes in and they probably have something where you can just follow the script and do it. But if you want to really engage in responsive teaching, I heard you say that a number of times, Pam, then there's just maybe a few choices out there. It's hard work. It's it hard, work. hard work. It's hard I work. I think it's a great balance between yes. just this whole extreme and of creating your own materials and finding mm -hmm. your own books and creating your own lesson plans totally. to be 100% responsive to um, each child, almost like writing an IEP for each child in your classroom, to a scripted totally. basal yep. series where you don't veer off of it. I think this is a great balance, leaning more to the responsive side, yes. but giving so many great resources Tons. and great suggestions that if you're a first year teacher, you still have a guide and you still have materials and you still have things to start with. And as you build oh, your great toolbox and your, your responsiveness and your knowledge base about what to do with students, you put your personal responses in there or more, the student's personal needs in there and then respond that way and it's flexible that way. That's what we love about it, that it doesn't leave the bottom drop out for teachers who maybe don't know what to do. And we all have that every year. We have that child who we're like, Great never point. seen this before. <laughs> but. I have one more question, I guess. Uh, we have a lot of folks in the room that use units of study. Can you touch really briefly on writing units of study in FTC? That's where I get really excited when we start talking about units of study for writing. Like that's when I get like really carried away. So I'll try not to get carried away. Um, in 30 seconds. But in a nutshell, <laughs> but I don't have a watch, so <laughs> 30 seconds is all relative. Um, but the writing units of study, in my opinion, is, um, I keep doing that, sorry, Matt, thank you. But the writing units of study is a, is a great complement to the instruction in FPC. The writing units of study provide that teaching opportunity for explicit writing instruction. So FPC, what it does is it, it, it teaches kids how to write about reading, but what writing units does is it te the, the writing units teach kids how to craft and develop their ideas, how to generate and produce a narrative, how to produce an, an expository text themselves. So the author's craft part of it is taught in the writing units, reinforced in FPC, if you will. Does that make sense? And so a lot of the writing that they're doing across FPC is in response to reading, which that kind of writing is all about comprehension. The writing units of study is all about learning to be an author yourself, learning all of the tools of the trade of writing and, and drafting your own thoughts and ideas. So it is a great compliment. All right, did good, right? Yeah, pretty good. Don't you think that was like 30 seconds, right?
I put out some more, we have tons and tons of samplers, so if you have folks back at the school or the district that would benefit from that, feel free to help yourself. Um, also one of our colleagues over there, you guys are most of them highlight connect with me. Um, thank you so much for making yes, the drive, thank getting you. up at the crack of dawn before the crack of dawn, and everybody else for joining us today, we appreciate it. Um, let's know if you have questions. And come look at the stuff, come yeah, touch it, yeah. look through it if you want to see it.